I have just now gotten a relatively good voice to text system in this phone. Mm, yeah, you and mentioned it's that to me off air. Yeah. Really good. It's really good because as I'm driving, you know, especially when you've got one of these drives, you know, two, three hours by yourself at some point or another, either ideas pop into your head and you just have to say them out loud or you're going to go a little daffy. At least that's how I am. Maybe that's not everybody, but I can't just sit there and enjoy the drive and go, oh, look at that. Nice wind turbine. Oh, look at that. Another nice wind turbine. I mean, that's that's the drive across Western Iowa, right? I have to get these ideas out of my head. I was able to narrate to myself a whole essay on a question of artificial intelligence and where it's all headed. And I've got I'll pose this to you, Brian Dean. I'm sure you'll enjoy this question. As we get better and better at the computing power, which the best evidence of the improvements in computing power is the smartphone that so many people, you know, whatever it is, your Android, your iPhone, whatever, the, the smartphones so many people are getting. I mean, that is probably case study number one in the power of improved computing. And the fact that I can talk into my phone and it will translate what I say into written text, and it gets it right with things that I don't expect. It gets technical language correct. It gets words, geographic locations. It gets West Des Moines correctly. Hmm. I don't expect West Des Moines to come out correctly, but it does. (laughs) And so, this is pretty impressive stuff. But one of the things that I'm wondering about is, as we improve that computing technology, and as we learn more about the brain, there was something on 60 Minutes tonight about people who have really incredible memories. And they were talking about trying to figure out what causes people to do that. And as we learn more about just how we think and what we do, I want to know how far off we are from the point at which we could figure out basically how much it would take to make a program resembling your personality pretty much impossible to distinguish from you personally. They call this the the Turing test. It's at the point at which a person who's interacting with the computer doesn't know if it's somebody in a chat room somewhere else literally typing in a response or if it's a computer responding back to them. And we're getting to the point where there are computing engines that can pretty much fake people out on the Turing test and pretty much get to the point where you can't tell if you're dealing with a computer or a human being who's just typing into a computer. Now, here's what I'm wondering, though. Those engines, let's call them personality engines, have to be based on a set of rules and they have to be based on a set of you know, logical circuits, basically, to be able to produce something like this. I wonder how many lines of code, essentially, it would take, or how many characteristics it would take to produce something that has a personality that would be specific to you. So, what it would take to write the Brian Dean personality engine, let's sure. call it. It would need to know what I find to be humorous. Exactly. And what would set me off, what would make me ponder, what would make me uh, 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 kind of Exactly, stutter. what would make a stammer. Exactly. exactly. It would exactly. need to know those things. But I'm wondering, what's how many things would it have to know in order to produce that? Because then you get into a really fascinating question. Because at some point then, we will reach that point. We'll figure it out. I mean, we were they were able to sequence the human genome in less than 15 years. That's pretty amazing. So clearly, these kinds of huge questions are within our grasp. Well, I'm saying this is like the human personality genome. What would it take to dig into figuring out enough to distinguish one person from another? And is that, is that where we want to go? Well, undoubtedly, somebody will go there. They, they'll have to. I mean, it's, almost, it's inevitable somebody will go that direction. And when they do, this is what I wonder about. Would it be valuable for the person occupying the White House to have these little personality, I'm going to call them personality engines because I don't know if there's another phrase for them and it, it makes sense to call them that. If there were, because they would call them graphics engines when it produces 3D graphics on your computer, so call it a personality engine. Would it behoove President Obama to have little personality engines for Abraham Lincoln and Ronald Reagan and Teddy Roosevelt sitting there advising him on Ooh, what to do? This sounds like something out of, you know, Star Trek it and the holodeck does. or whatever. It kind of uh, does. Yeah. And it wouldn't have to be like this Max Hedrum version of Ronald Reagan's head talking back at you. But maybe it would be valuable to know, given this set of information, this set of circumstances, what would the most likely outcome have been based upon what other things Ronald Reagan or Teddy Roosevelt or FDR or whoever had done in the past. You know, you probably would ignore the James Buchanan engine. You probably wouldn't pay a lot of attention to the Martin Van Buren one. But you might be curious what, you know, what would Lincoln do? You know, you might be curious about this kind of a thing. And I wonder how many lines or how many 
areas you would have to put in, how many characteristics you'd have to figure out in order to produce a personality engine for Abraham Lincoln or for somebody else. And let's take it a step further. Let's say it's not just, I mean, it starts at the high level. I mean, it would be, you could see how it's valuable to like the White House. I wonder though, I don't think it's, I think it's inevitable. I don't think it would be much farther afield for this to then become, well, maybe you can program in your ancestors. You know, your family, your your favorite teachers, and so forth. You could find what those personalities are. Maybe they're alive. Maybe they're not alive. You know, if they kept a good journal, maybe that's enough. You know, somebody keeps a really good diary, that might be enough to tell you what they would have done, and be enough to program in this personality engine. And then when you do this, I know this is sounding a little crazy, but it, it's it's going to happen, and I think it's going to happen within twenty years. That you're going to be able to say, well, you know what? Here's Grandma's personality engine. What would grandma tell me to do in this kind of wow. circumstance? And maybe she's been gone for 20 or 30 yeah. years. Then you have those interactions with the computer, which again is passing the Turing test. You can't really tell that it's a computer responding to you. Now, how does that mess with your world if you mm-hmm. could essentially bring people's personalities back from beyond the grave? I find that such a fascinating question. That may I know be it's, something that gets banned. See, I see, I can see how people would find it a little disturbing. Yeah. I would see how it might be possible, but you know, and you're and you're right. You're you, since we were talking about having the internet on our phones <laughs> exactly twenty years ago. The internet was something used by what scientists mm-hmm. and the Defense Department exactly, and the rest of us had never heard of it exactly. And then within twenty years, it's gone from exactly like you say something that was only used by a handful of people on the planet, mm-hmm. and now it's universal and portable and yeah. universal. Yeah. And the thing, and the reason I get down this this line is, I think it was because I heard a commercial for Microsoft's search engine Bing, and they you know they keep talking about how it's not a search engine, it's a decision engine. And that's what got me to thinking. I thought, well, now, wait a minute. Your decisions aren't really based upon the data. It's based upon your personality. And it's based upon your tastes and preferences for things. And it's based upon the advice that you get from people. I mean, I'm not going to go to a search engine and type in, you know, well, what do you think I should do about this girl, Grandma? I think we're getting pretty serious. I'm not sure. But that's the kind of question upon which you might want advice. And if it weren't Google or Microsoft, I were asking, but instead, my grandmother's personality, or you know, whoever it might be. I'm just throwing it out there because you know it seems comforting to say grandma instead of a creepy cyborg or something. <laughs> but that that might be the kind of question you might wish to ask. And because I'm getting into the habit of asking my computer questions about things like where's the nearest post office in Omaha that's open after five o'clock, and I no longer think that's an unreasonable question to ask. I don't think we're that far off from asking much more serious and much more personal questions of these personality engines in the not too distant future. I don't think it's that far away at all. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'd put some money on it today, and I'm not even a betting kind of man, so maybe I'd have to consult uh, the James Buchanan engine about that one. (laughs) Or not.